Sisters and brothers, we know that new challenges are emerging on the job all the time. Your work environment is constantly changing. And while most of you have the training and resources to manage consumer battery incidents, a new challenge is emerging with lithium-ion batteries and energy storage systems. These high-voltage systems are being installed in mixed occupancy and high-rise buildings across the United States and Canada. And they create unique risk and challenges when you respond to an emergency. The use of these systems can create the potential for a fire protection hazard known as thermal runaway and must be treated differently than a traditional electrical fire. This program will discuss the aspects of these energy storage systems and lithium ion batteries, offering critical safety tips for you and your crew to use when you're responding to these fires and structures with these systems. Take care and stay safe out there. The purpose of the UL9548 test method is to ensure that the fire protection of an installation matches the hazards demonstrated in fire testing of energy storage equipment. The data from UL9540A enables uh, authorities having jurisdiction, insurers and building owners to make sure that the fire protection requirements uh, of the installations are code and installation standard compliant. So UL9540A evaluates the fire growth and spread potential, the uh, potential for explosions due to battery off-gassing, and provides data necessary for fire protection engineers and manufacturers to design fire protection uh, equipment and for fire departments to perform fire incident pre-planning. UL9540A was developed so that any battery chemistry can be evaluated. The approach is technology agnostic and begins with testing at the cell level. From the uh, lithium ion side, the lithium ion side of it, the batteries, um, the Achilles heel is usually heat. So what they're going to do is they're going to that they're going to put them up in, in on fire to see how they react in fire. They're looking to actually uh, come up with some sort of testing that can be repeated and trying to figure out how these dis different systems. Um, how these different systems will react because not all energy storage systems are made the same. So you have uh, a couple of different standard development organizations. One is Underwriters Laboratory, and Underwriters Laboratory will actually test the product itself. For instance, in this case, you'll have the energy storage system that will have to go through product testing. UL 1973, or which is for the batteries themselves, uh, UL 1741, which is the inverter, which is also part of the product, all of that would be uh, tested against the UL certifications. And once they have the certifications, they went through a battery of tests to make sure that they were safe. Now you take that product and you stick it into a room, and that's where the NFPA will pick up. The NFPA will uh, protect the room and the building itself. When a manufacturer comes to UL, the first step we take in a 9540A evaluation is to determine if their technology uh, has propensity for thermal runaway. If it does, we proceed on to the next level of testing, which determines if thermal runaway can spread from cell to cell. That would be like in a battery pack or, a, or what we call a module. From module testing, we move on to unit level testing, which determines if thermal runaway and fire can propagate from module to module as they're configured as part of a larger installation. Uh, typically, you'd see this in a rack. So if fire can propagate from module to module, the next step is to determine if there's enough heat transfer to the compartment to cause concerns with combustible construction or concerns with fire spread to other uh, units or cabinets. From there, if the tests have demonstrated uh, fire behavior still needing mitigation, manufacturers can work with us to bring a designed fire protection system in to mitigate that hazard. I think it's a critical test for the fire service. One of the things in the fire service, we have new technologies come to the market continuously. It's an ever evolving work environment for that fire service. But what we'd like to see out of new technology, out of new products and the new systems is consistency and what to expect when there is a failure. So we can start to plan accordingly. 9540A is giving the manufacturers and the AHJs consistency when it applies to energy storage systems and what to expect, expect in the event of a failure. Thermal runaway is important in batteries because it can result in the generation of a great amount of heat 
which further propagates thermal runaway into other cells, which can then propagate to modules, units, and become a building and life safety hazard. What makes fires in energy storage systems different is that the fire growth can be rapid and very challenging to suppress. Reignitions are possible and uh, unpredictable. Well, for instance, uh, we did learn that some of these uh, lithium ion batteries in particular, um, they have a high heat release rate. So uh, that's got to be established on how much water is needed in order to try to stop the propagation of the lithium ion batteries from going from rack to rack. So a tremendous amount of energy stored in a small little area, a small dense area uh, of the building, something that can power the building for a couple of hours, anywhere from four in some situations, eight hours of the day. So think of a, think of a large high rise building and, and actually putting that building on battery power for about four hours of the day. So the stakeholders involved in 9540A is really everyone. And that starts with the manufacturer who needs to demonstrate compliance for their installation. And then it extends to the authority having jurisdiction who's looking for that compliance, as well as insurers and the building owner. Ultimately, the rest of us end up as stakeholders as public occupants in those buildings. The ultimate objective is to help the AHJ determine at what level a fire incident starting in an energy storage system is contained. So testing will progress from the cell to the module to the unit and possibly to the installation level until data demonstrates that the fire has been contained. So we're looking for obvious signs of propagation of thermal runaway and flaming, and then we'll be measuring heat release rate, off-gassing from batteries to determine the flammability and explosibility characteristics of the gas, uh, as well as potential for reignitions that might cause concern for the fire department. It's important for the fire service to know that, uh, that this test that's being done is there for their safety. If this test wasn't done, then we wouldn't have a general idea on how these things are going to be installed, and that could be a big problem for the fire department and also for the responders. Some of the things that uh, firefighters should be concerned about is number one, there is a uh, high heat release rate. So when you have something that's high heat, you need a lot of water in order to actually absorb that heat. The second thing that you need to be concerned about is that before they actually go on fire, they release a flammable cocktail. And that flammable cocktail is a mixture of different flammable gases inside of it. Um, that is just waiting for an ignition source. So when you have that ignition source, you could have an explosion inside the room. If you have these things on the 80s, 80th floor of a high-rise building. <laughs> You're taking down walls, that's pretty precarious. So fire resistance and propagation of thermal runaway and energy storage systems are, are two different tests. So UL 9540A's scope is limited to determining the likelihood of propagation in energy storage equipment, but fire resistance of floors, walls, and ceilings is determined under fire conditions in furnace testing to determine the structural integrity and thermal transmission. It's also important to remember that the thermal exposure from an energy storage system and a fire test furnace are not the same. So these two pieces of paper represent uh, the positive terminal and the negative terminal of a battery. And if you touch the two positive and negative terminal together, you'll have a reaction that takes place. That reaction will cause heat and that heat will start a fire. So what they do in a lithium ion cell is they usually take a separator. So this third piece of paper here is going to simulate a separator. So the separator goes between the positive terminal and the negative terminal, so they don't touch each other. But any type of puncture through this separator here will actually have the positive terminal touching the negative terminal, and that in itself will start some sort of heat reaction that takes place. As the heat continues to build up, the separator will continue to decompose, and that decomposition will cause more heat, and so on and so on, to the point that you'll have a fire. So if you were to take this here and roll it up, this here would be like a cylindrical battery. And if I were to crush this, like that. Just think of something actually coming down on top of the energy storage system. If I were to crush it like this, and this is just to simulate uh, two cylindrical cells inside a module. 
So there could be hundreds or even thousands of cells inside a module. If this one were to have a reaction and it starts to heat up, the heat from this one will actually transfer to the cell adjacent to it. And that cell eventually will start to go on fire just like this one. And then next to that will be another cell. And that heat from now this other cell will transfer to the next cell and so on and so on and so on until you have all the cells in the module going up and eventually you'll have modules from, from module to module going up in flames. And what's really unique about these things is that sometimes it takes a long time for it to start to react. So the firefighters could actually be leaving the scene from the car fire, not having any idea whether that energy storage system was even involved because there was nothing showing that it was involved. And then sure enough, hours later, we could have that energy storage system going up in flames as a result of the compromise of the um, separators that are going to be inside the cells themselves that could start the reaction, that could start the heat, and eventually have propagation with a thermal runaway event. In the fire service, we need to be cognizant of our work environment. Our work environment continuously changes over time. We see new products and new technologies. Similar to 30 years ago, we didn't have electrical vehicles driving around our streets. But alternative fuels such as electric vehicles or hydrogen fueled vehicles are becoming commonplace. So we've, we've enacted training programs in order to understand how to respond to these incidents and what are the concerns of our response to these incidents. The built environment is no different. We see new systems come in, uh, especially with the growth of renewable energy in that marketplace. If you look at the state of California is requiring renewable energy on all new homes. This is going to propagate this new energy storage into homes, into office spaces. Uh, this is something that we're just gonna have to learn to deal with. We're gonna have to train on it, we're gonna have to understand it, we're gonna have to understand the complexities that come along with it and the tactical considerations that we must deploy. So something that's very unique about energy storage system fires is that they're like deep-seated or shielded fires. It can be very ac uh, difficult to access what's burning with a suppressing agent. Um, what's also unique about fires and energy storage systems is that thermal runaway can propagate from cell to cell just by heat conduction. So really cooling is necessary. Uh, if you're not providing cooling, you may be affecting flaming, but not stopping the propagation of thermal runaway. But the question is, how do you get them out safely? Because they could reignite. And the example that I like to use is there was a, an incident that took place in New York City where a guy had his um, mattress on fire, tried to put it out. It was still smoldering. He put it into the elevator, tried to take it out of the building itself. It wound up lighting up inside the elevator. When he came down, he was burnt beyond recognition inside the elevator when the elevator doors opened up on the ground floor. So you always, you know, I looked at it from that point of view as that, hey, guess what? These things could uh, reignite and how do we get them, if they were in the upper floors, how do we get them out safely? What's the safe way of actually getting them out? So, so energy storage, some places supply an SDS sheet, which is the new terminology for the MSDS sheet as we used to know it, which is a safety data sheet. Um, and some places, some battery manufacturers are saying that they're not considered hazardous materials. So it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Uh, the DOT for transportation, they consider it a hazardous material, but if you took a look at the DOT, um, they, I think they're in the process of updating their guidelines for a fire during a transportation accident with energy storage. They uh, originally had recommended that you use foam for this particular type of fire, but we realized that foam is conductive for electricity. And we also realized that foam doesn't have the cooling capacity as water. So you need something in order to absorb a high heat release, and foam is really more for smothering or smothering vapors so they don't go on uh, fire. In this situation, we make a recommendation to uh, DOT, the IFF actually has made some recommendations to the DOT uh, about changing that and putting that on, uh, putting water as the uh, suppressant for a lithium ion during transportation fires. Uh, some of these systems that were put out there uh, inside containers, they were put in what they call clean agents. So clean agents really just knock out the oxygen. But in this situation, uh, it's not about knocking out the oxygen. They also don't have the cooling capacity. There's no cooling capacity. If you can't absorb the heat, 
then you're not going to stop the reaction, and the reaction will continue to, to run its course and start a uh, thermal runaway, which will propagate to cell to cell, and then possibly module to module, and then rack to rack, and so on. In a typical structure fire, the fire service is dealing with a known fuel load. Uh, whether it's uh, combustible construction or non-combustible construction, using the fuel loads of that modern fire environment, we can start to understand what our engine companies are going to be able to perform with the given water that they have. Uh, when we have a failure of an energy storage system, there's some critical components that we need to understand from the fire service perspective. Uh, one of the goals that we have is to get water on the burning surfaces. And the challenge with energy storage systems, we just can't get the water to the burning surfaces. So what are the elements that we have to evaluate as a fire service? And what are the tactics that we need to, to deploy? Uh, those are the lessons that we're gaining out of this testing and this research.